Okay, and then I am going to share my screen here. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Bea Maki Kao, uh, pronouns she, her, hers. I'm the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Manager for the City of San Luis Obispo, and I'm excited to talk to you about our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion grant opportunity through the city. Going to give you a lot of information in the beginning and really want to leave the end as an opportunity for you all to ask any questions that you might have of staff um, or talk through any ideas that might per be percolating in your, in your brain as you have been thinking about this opportunity or following the information that we give you tonight. So I really want to first start off by just having you all get to know our team a little bit and understand like what is the staffing structure behind the grant program. Um, so these grants will be will live in um, the Human Relations Commission and our commissioners will really serve as the subcommittee of initial grant review. That subcommittee will then re provide recommendations to the entire body of the commissioners and those commissioners commissioners will then determine um, recommendations to go to city council. I'll talk a little bit more just about that structure in this presentation, but just so that you understand the role of the Human Relations Commission within this process. And then we have city staff who are supporting the grant program. So myself, um, some of you have already reached out to me, which has been great, um, but I will be your primary contact for the application or grant questions up until the closing of the grant, um, August 31st at 5 p.m. We also have on this call Matthew Melendres, who is our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Management Fellow, um, and he will be a uh, grant support for contract execution and will be assisting with the reporting process of the grant. Um, and then I think I just realized I'm perhaps not on, you get to see all my notes. Is, did that fix it? Looks like it. Okay. No, you can still see all presenter view. Now I'm good. Okay, great. Um, and then also we have on our team, Dale McGee, who is a logistical grant review support. Um, she was integral in the first year of the DEI high impact grant cycle. So having some of that historical context is gonna be important and then helping us during, um, to support the Human Relations Commission in the grant review process um, also on this call tonight. So both of them I hope will back me up um, through the night if things come up or if there's additional information that we can provide you all. So I just really want to do a larger overview of this grant program. I'm also going to drop a link in the chat. All of the information that I'm going to give you tonight is on our website. Um, so just know that you don't have to have this all written down and you can revisit visit it. Um, but the funding allocation of the DEI high impact grant program was really intended to support local projects, programs, or initiatives that contribute to creating a San Luis Obispo that is welcoming, inclusive, equitable, and safe. This year, there is a total of $300,000 in available funding, um, and that's a total pot. Um, so uh, all of the preliminary recommendations um, that the HRC makes will be looking at just that entire pot to fund applicants. I do wanna know this is a one-time increase from 150,000 to account for two funding cycles. Um, so we did miss a funding cycle in 2022, and that was a decision made by council and city staff to not roll those dollars up, um, but instead roll them forward to have a larger grant cycle for this year. Uh, the funding is really focused on narrowing equity gaps that have disproportionately impact marginalized communities. These gaps can include, but are not limited to uh, gaps, uh, equity gaps in physical and mental health services, gaps in education, housing, criminal justice, and food security. And I'll get into more detail about some examples of what funding can look like now. The funds can be really used for projects or services that reduce equity gaps and improve justice, equity, diversity, and or in inclusion in the city of San Luis Obispo. Proposals can really focus on specific marginalized communities, the community at large, and or systemic change. Some examples of the activities and can include, but are not limited to social justice, anti-racism activities or programs, ally or advocacy trainings or programs, business development, civic engagement for historically underrepresented people that might be voter registration or participation workshops to inspire increased civic engagement, uh, community arts projects, education improvements with assistance or access related, um, gaps toward, to education, healthcare, 
mentoring or apprenticeship programs, community spaces, places to gather and build community, translated materials and interpretation to ensure diverse community, communities can participate, um, provide programs and services in non-traditional settings that increase access uh, to those services. So those again are just some examples and at the end of this i'm actually going to give share with you all um, examples of the programs that were funded in the first year of, of this grant cycle to really sort of contextualize it a bit more. Um, grants can be used for the following purposes. Um, sorry, one sec, I just want to double check I got a little message that we have some folks in the waiting room, so I want to make sure that I get them in. But yeah, and I, I believe we can still see where it says no, it's still, not, not anymore. Now it's good. Okay. Okay, sorry, one sec. Here we go. All right. So I just want to make every, everyone's okay now. Oops. It looks good, Bea. Yeah, okay. Um, all right, I think I have everyone in now. Uh, okay, so I just finished covering the use of grant funds and then um, some grant, the exclusion to grant funds. So grants cannot be used for the following purposes. They can't be used to advance a political cause. So for specific political parties or for um, candidate political candidates, religious activities or for profit or personal gain. And then um, organization, I wanna speak specifically to the organization eligibility. I've gotten some questions about this piece. Um, so organizations must have nonprofit status, 501c3, or be a government or education entity or faith-based organization. Collaborations between one or more organizations or groups are welcome and encouraged. At least one um, in the partnership needs to be an eligible entity noted above. Applicants must demonstrate core values of justice, equity, diversity, and or inclusion in their mission and operations. Organizations that received a DEI grant during the previous funding cycle must have complied with all reporting requirements to be considered for a 2022-23 grant. Um, the program must extend access to the general public and be in good standing with the city. Okay, and now I'm going to cover program eligibility. So we just went over organization. And so the programs um, must occur primarily in the city. Funding activities must primarily serve city residents. Applicants that provide services in neighboring communities, but also serve a significant number of city res residents will be considered. Um, and I would say that was pretty common across our first year applicants. Requests must be for programs or services um, with the ability to show measurable impact and successes. And that we'll, we'll get into a little bit about what that means when I talk about the reporting process for um, grant awardees. Must meet current state and county health and safety guidelines. I think that's more related to if you're looking at in-person programming, just making sure that we're aligned with those guidelines. And then program, program, program activities must have started during the current fiscal year funding cycle. So once we execute contracts, they have to be started before June 30th, 2023. Um, and now I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about the evaluation process of the DEI grant selection. So the Human Relations Committee, uh, Human Relations Commission subcommittee will review applicants and re recommend grant awards to City Council. Um, Applicant applications are going to be evaluated based on a set criteria that directly align with the purpose of the grant um, and grant use requirements. City Council ultimately has final discretion and approval for grant awards. So this will go as a business item to City Council and they will ultimately um, have the final vote on where the funds will be allocated. Proposals will be evaluated for meeting an, ident an identified need, potential to succeed, ability to make high impact or advance systemic change, and for serving marginalized communities. Um, if awarded funds for the full amount, awarded will be dispersed via check within 60 days of receiving the signed grant agreement. So here are some of the grant reporting requirements 
um, that I mentioned earlier, those of you who receive a grant will be expected to submit a mid-year progress report and final reports. Final reports must include administrator's report, a statistical report, financial report, highlights on challenges and successes, and then any information about sustainability plans of the project or program, in some cases even staffing um, that you've received funding for. And those final reports are going to be due within 90 days of the conclusion of the funded project. And again, we'll have staff who will be following up with all grant awardees about timelines of when those reports are due. Um, they're really not meant to add additional labor. We're here to support you um, in managing the grant process and, and making sure that we're communicating with you when those are due. I uh, wanted to walk through some timeline pieces. Um, so right now we're in the grant application period. It's open. Uh, September is when our HRC uh, Human Relations Commission subcommittee is going to make initial recommendations. Actually, that sub subcommittee is finalizing and forming tomorrow night at the Human Relations Commission meeting. Um, and then October 5th will be the meeting in which the commission as a whole will review and adopt the subcommittee recommendations. Um, that's gonna be definitely a time where we'll be communicating with all applicants, encouraging folks to come. That's really when the commission is gonna get in depth about what the recommendations were and solidify those final recommendations to go to city council. November 15th will be the day in which we'll be going to city council as a business item to review the um, Human Relations Commission final recommendations for council. And then within the December and January, recognizing those are um, busier months, tend to be holiday months for folks. Um, our goal is to get service agreements out and then funds be awarded in January of 2023. Um, DEI grant application is live. Again, I'm going to drop the link once I'm done sharing my screen here. It's due August 31st by 5 p.m. I had some folks reach out uh, that filling out the application, they had challenges saving their edits. Just wanted to let you all know that has been corrected. So now there is a button at the bottom of that where you can save your work and save your draft. However, if you would prefer a fillable form, please feel free to email me or dei at slowcity.org and I can get you a fillable form. And you can also mail in grant applications as well. So here are some examples of programs that were funded in 21, 2022. Um, we had uh, diversity education training programs that were offered through the Diversity Coalition through um, our unified school districts. We had a community summit on undocu allyship, which is really successful. We saw uh, increased Spanish translation of garden and health curriculum um, for from One Cool Earth. We had a belonging 2021 multimedia arts experience that was really centering on the needs of the Black community within San Luis Obispo. There's a little snippet of the playlist that was created. There was an art exhibit. There was a community block party. A number of events came from that um, art experience. We saw a Change Makers Film Festival um, really feature Black, Indigenous, people of color filmmakers. We saw increased free health and support services for uninsured Black, Indigenous, people of color residents. We also saw a year long theater production centered on increasing access, um, on increasing access, diversity, equity, and justice through the arts and through theater. Um, and then uh, the the funds also supported Literacy for Life and their operations in which they offer within the community. So we had a, a smaller pot of money in this first round, and it was also the first time that we were offering these funds. And so it was really incredible to see our local organizations come together um, and submit applications and programs that were really aligned with the intended purpose of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion High Impact Grant Program, um, and then see the selection and the, and the council approve that funding. Um, so I'm going to pause there and stop sharing so I can see folks um, and open it up for some questions, follow up insight, also turn to my staff, Dale. I don't know if you, there was a couple of tidbits or anything that you wanted to add um, before I really open it up for questions. Yeah, I think a great tee up. Okay. Um, it's really your time and we just want to be able to support you in clarifying information that you might have or um, direct time with staff to help you as we enter the final month of application. Feel free to raise your hand or unmute.
Okay, <clears throat> sure. I'll ask up. Um, I'm guessing this is a one year um, term that the um, grants have to be used then by December of 2023. Is that correct? They have to, programs have to have started um, and be primarily underway by June of 2023. Okay. And then finished by the end of the calendar year? Or ideally, I mean, ideally, that would be ideal, but there will be, that's really what those mid-year and final reports are for. So by mid-year, we'll have a good sense of, you know, what is the, per, where you're at with your project. Um, and then reevaluate where you are by the final term. But there is some flexibility in that. And I think a majority of what the funded activities were for, we would like to be completed. Thank you. Um, Elijah? Hi, it's Alicia. Alicia, thank you. Okay, so in regards to measurable impact and successes for programs that, of course, haven't been started yet um, and the application, are we looking for, um, are we looking for examples of previous projects and impact and successes there? or projected for this existing project. Can you give a little bit of guidelines on what would be um, successful for this application project, uh, uh, application for a project that has not yet been started yet? Yeah, great question. I think um, it would mostly be the latter around um, uh, tactics for how you will measure the success of the program um, and then what you expect the outcomes to be of the program in terms of success measurements. So, I mean, I think it only strengthens an application to provide examples of similar programs in other cities that have been really successful. Um, but I think if you have clarity around how you will measure the success of the program that you are launching and then your projected outcomes, that would be a strong application. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Mary. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to talk directly to the people who are responsible for this grant. I have a couple questions. You spoke about collaboration with other entities. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, um, great question. So some organizations within the community don't have 501c3 status or may have a different classification of nonprofit organization. And so we didn't want to limit it to those. And, and part of how we mitigate that is encouraging collaboration. So let's say X organization didn't have 501c3, but then they connected with Y who does and wanted to put in a joint submission, then both could apply for the grant funding as long as one has the designated um, requirements of um, a 501c3 government education or faith-based organization. Okay, thank you. And my second question is you said, stated this needs to be open to the public. What does that mean? Yeah, so they can't be closed events. Um, so for example, I mentioned the belonging series. Um, that was a block, a block party centering black experiences and black voices, and it was open to the entire public community. Um, so it wasn't a closed event that city community members couldn't participate in. So like sort of shifting away from exclusive to uh, inclusive of community participation. Okay. Hey, can I add to just a quick clarity? Um, hi, Mary. It's been a long hi. time. Hi. Um, Regarding also closed, um, obviously, if a project is a school based or very specific targeted population, it's not the expectation like it, let's go back to education, something that was funded last year, it wasn't anticipated that adults will be able to go onto the junior high com campus and be in class and things like that. So if there's a very specific targeted population that in and of themselves is a unique group, of course, please write for that don't think that you need to expand for everything, but if it is a community based of okay. programming event yeah. so maybe that they are right the very specific is it if it's a one-time sort of event it needs to be all inclusive um and mary can um be real quick if i can go back to also the partnership um it also doesn't have to necessarily partnership just because someone doesn't have their 501c3 you could just be two qualified um organizations that want to do something together to magnify the effort we had some applicants that did that like an advocacy group with a um like a legal situation, you know, legal assistance. So then they partnered for like a shared staff person was a suggestion. So um, 
it's you can partner just to be creative. Yeah, good point. Thank you. Thanks, Mia. Katie. Thanks for the opportunity. I'm here uh, as a board member for Slow for Home, which is a new organization that is providing refugee resettlement. And so um, since our 501c3 is currently pending with the IRS, would the letter uh, received from the IRS be sufficient to allow us to apply solely or would we have to find a partner that is currently a, um, a fully certified 501c3? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I want to say, but also we'll say that I'm going to confirm with legal that yeah. if you have 501c3 by the time of contracting, then we should be okay. But if you don't, I'm not sure the answer to that question. So let me circle back with our city attorney. Okay. Um, and get back to Katie, can I ask you to put your email, a good email for you in the chat? Sure, absolutely. Um, because we've been told that it could take up to a year and a half, okay. um, which we applied, I believe, in November of last year. So it may not be um, available to us in January mm -hmm. of 2023. Yeah. Um, and then just for clarification's sake, um, based on what Dale said about the general benefits or the general um, community public being invited. Since we are providing service to particular families and individuals, I'm curious how that um, fits into the question about general public and do we need to factor in some sort of public benefit a workshop or some sort of education for the community to make it more compelling? Um, or is it something that we could be focused on the services provided to those families? So you can focus on the services, I think, for clarity. When we're offering an event um, to the community, that mm -hmm. event needs to be open to the public. If you are addressing a specific equity gap or gap in service for a specific population, that is okay and speaks directly to the grant purpose, right? To mitigate equity gaps, support inclusion or belonging for a specific population within services. Um, so I think if you think like um, service provider, you can have a, a specific focus as long as you're articulating what gaps and services you're providing. If you're thinking event or um, general like public educational workshop, that has to be open to everybody. Got it. That makes sense. And, and, and Katie, um, yeah. nice to see you too. I do. Um, <laughs> Um, regarding your um, 501c3 status, what you might want to consider in your application is like a fallback saying, you know, please consider us and we are prepared, even if we're not a 501c3, because this will be our fiscal agent. And maybe you attach a fiscal agent who says, sure, we'll, we'll back this. We had, I think, two grants FAYA last year that had a fiscal agent. Yeah. And we do have a fiscal agent. I'm trying to be thoughtful about the ramifications of running the money through the fiscal agent. And there is a fee associated with that. Yeah, and right. so we're just trying to be thoughtful about not to ace them out, but we would like to be able to provide every dollar for support as opposed to administration. But I understand your, your answer for sure or suggestion. Yeah. Understood on saving the administrative fee. Yeah, <laughs> thank you all. Um, and then Noha, I think you unmuted yourself for a question. I was just gonna um, say for Katie, I could touch base with her later, but we're good. We're good for now. <laughs> okay, cool. And then Anne, I know you had your hand up, but maybe you got your question answered. Well, I, um, I am anticipating your answer and wondering about asking it, but I find that the GIA grants that awards kind of um, hover in the sort of uh, four to twelve thousand dollar range. That that they tend to be kind of of that size. I, I mean, I know you're you're likely to say we we would award a great project more maybe, but is that your guess or or what you kind of imagine seeing something in that kind of three to fifteen thousand dollar realm, 
would uh, I guess would I have some good reason to submit a larger project? Uh, I would say yes. Uh, I would. I'm hesitant to put like a, a bottom dollar on it. It's a large pot of money, and I think my sentiment from um, the grants historical purpose and where our commissioners at is they're really looking to fund projects and programs that can have high impact. Um, and we recognize that sometimes the smaller pockets of money are just meeting a, a need and don't really allow for that next level of creativity, impact. And so I would I would say that there's definitely an openness to fund larger projects. Um, and, you know, in our first round of grant dollars where we had less, we funded projects up to thirty five thousand dollars. Um, and so there was it was more about what is the program proposal? What is the need? what was the intention of this program and um, the reviewing subcommittees um, sentiments around which which applications are most aligned with the funding criteria. Um, so I've heard from a number of organizations who are interested in submitting larger applications. I will say, which I've said to others, it's really helpful um, to tear out what the funds will be used for, because we saw in the first round of, of funding review, and I've seen this with our Human Relations Commission, it's helpful for them at times where they want to fund a specific part of the project. Um, and if they don't have information about where dollars will go and what aspects of the projects, it's hard for them to say, oh, well, we don't want to fund the whole thing, but we want to fund this percentage of your project so you can do X, Y, Z. So it's really helpful if you have some sort of table or information about all components of the project and where the dollars are going, because more often than not, I've seen the review committee say, we might not be prepared to fund the whole project, but we do want to fund, you know, 50% or even 80% of the project in these areas. Great, great, got it. And then a tag along question on top of that. Um, will you help me understand how we fit um, generally low income or economically challenged people into this equity equation uh, that may be aligned with or separate from um, BIPOC uh, populations? I'm not quite sure how we fit that in or talk about that or count that. Yeah, our low income community is certainly a part of our most marginalized communities within the city of San Luis Obispo. Um, so I would say if you're having a program that's specifically looking to address an equity gap for our low income community members that's directly aligned what we know is we often see overlap or intersection amongst our low income populations and identities of race and ethnicity. Um, so what we've seen is there's correlations, correlations between Black, Indigenous, people of color, and LGBTQ plus populations with those who identify or who fall under our low income populations within SLO. Okay, great. So, so if I understand correctly, we don't have to ferret out necessarily um, that um, BIPOC portion of a low income population, that would be kind of assumed that that population would be helped in a generally lower income population cohort? I think um, partially, but I mean, not to the extent that I think would really be a strong part of your application. I think if you have data, if you say generally we're looking to serve and focus on the needs of low income populations, and if you have data from your programs or your nonprofit that has demographic information about who makes up that population or who's using your services, that, that really strengthens the application. Um, otherwise, you know, we're really leaving it to the commissioners and the reviewers discretion to, to determine that. So I also don't wanna guarantee that that will be something that happens. Um, where I've seen applications be most successful is when they're able to include additional data about the communities in which their organization or program is serving specifically. Thank you very much. Yeah, to add to that, just if it's even more helpful, specific, um, in the past, there was a grant also serving sort of the population you're speaking about, um, and the grant reviewers asked, um, actually, I believe they actually included in their narrative of they were going to go at a specific, they were going to do extra outreach to specific subsets. So you might want to consider that, and particularly for them, um, Latino community. But you could you could say that, and then the committee may come back to you and say, "How will you be reaching out to 
you know, subset populations. Got it. Thank you. That's helpful. Can I ask a clarifying question about something that came up previous to that question? Um, I'm noticing, and I just want to make sure that I'm understanding correctly, there's an expansion of proposals that could possibly be included or approved this time that maybe weren't the last cycle. Um, for example, uh, Bea, you mentioned anti-racist education. Um, does that include two mainstream communities or does it need to be only servicing marginalized communities? No, that includes, I don't think that there's been expanded thing. I think when our initial review, we had a, a task force that was very spe specific in their purpose and sort of commission for what they were intending to do and their focus was very much to focus on the needs of black indigenous people of color. And I think that's maybe where the drive, some of the driving indicators of the first round of funds, but um, the scope of projects hasn't changed. Um, and the use of funds uh, activities hasn't changed. It's actually quite similar to our first round. I think what is different now is we have a, a larger advisory body who's going to be reviewing them that doesn't have sort of that directive of focusing on the needs specifically of Black, Indigenous, people of color. And so I think that really was a driver. But even in um, some of the selections that were made, like they they reached larger populations of people. So I, for, and I don't wanna speak from the commission, but I think there is a, an awareness of the need of dominant populations when it comes to education and our ability to advance equity, inclusion and belonging within the city of SLO. So I would say in short, yes, there will be, um, I think a, a larger scale of projects looked at critically and, and again, um, aligned with what is the intended purpose of the funds. Uh, just two things. One is the chat function doesn't seem to be um, enabled, so I can't send my appropriate email address. Let's see if I can. I can pop up the um, participant list, but it doesn't allow for chats. Yeah, shoot. We, I, we share this Zoom account with all other advisory bodies. And so I unfortunately don't have a city clerk on here who could fix it for me right away. Yep. Um, if you could just, before we finish, if you could just pop up your uh, contact information again, um, I just would, I'll send you an email for my email. Yes. That'd well, be great. And then the second question I had is, will, will the existing, round of grantees be required to resubmit an application for this round of funding? Yes. And how much was the total amount granted in the last round? We had 120,000 and they ultimately gave out just under 110,000. Great, thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Rita? Um, thank you. Um, I haven't seen this um, specified in at, at least at a glance on the website, uh, but I wanted to check if there was any position regarding direct aid. Yeah, so I've gotten that question and I've checked in with our city attorney. Um, the short answer is yes, it will be allowed. There will be require some more significant um, clarification. So we would need to know explicitly um, eligibility process and selection for direct aid. We would need to know the um, selection process and tracking process of how those funds are being used. Um, and the purpose for direct aid will have to go back and directly align with um, aspects of our diversity, equity, and inclusion major city goal. Um, and may require additional approval from the city attorney's office and city council. Um, so it is possible, we just need real clarity on the eligibility and selection process for how that aid will be dispersed and then how like management of um, the funds being used for what they were intended to be used. So other examples like um, 
that we've seen is folks giving out grocery cards um, as a way to still provide direct aid, but in line with the intended purpose of the funds. Um, we saw, um, for example, we just piloted giving Haslo um, um, and piloting the grants for childcare um, services within the city. So we've definitely seen it happen. So we're learning each time a little bit about what that process should look like. Um, so just as much clarity as you can provide, and then depending on uh, commission recommendations, we will likely reach out for additional information um, and review with council. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from folks? I'm going to just share my screen one more time for my contact information. Please feel free to reach out directly to me if additional questions come up. You can also email dei at slowcity.org. I'm really excited about this funding cycle. The first year was exciting to do it for the first time. Now we have a much larger pot of dollars and in conversations tonight and also with other folks, incredible local organizations doing incredible work within this community to advance and address equity gaps, um, foster a sense of community and belonging within, within San Luis Obispo. And I know myself and the commission are really excited to see what applications we get um and to show to our city council what can be done um, with a large a part of dollars this is the largest amount of dollars that any advisory body has ever allocated out um, so it's pretty significant oh. rita yes yeah, sorry Bea. um do you have any position or recommendation uh if an organization wants to submit more than one like i'm thinking if we have an organization like on docu support who provides direct aid but at the same time has another project uh, do you recommend combining those two uh asks in one grant or do you recommend them splitting them up does it make a difference or not i am it's hard to say so organizations can only receive one um, award so for example you couldn't be the recipient of two awards for two different programs um, it might be beneficial, sort of referencing what I had mentioned before, if it was one general application and, and both strategies were aligned to meet a specific equity gap within our community that serves undocumented population, um, so that the reviewers could look at it fully and determine, yes, we want to fund the whole thing and or we'd like to fund the grants and aid, for example, and not the other, the staff person just making things up. So it, it, there might be some um, value in having a larger package and then lining it out um, for the different initiatives. Thank you. Katie? I'm, I apologize, but I'm not keeping track of um, what year of the fiscal plan this is anymore. So, <laughs> Could you, um, is this the first year, is this money in the first year of the two-year fiscal plan? For the city? Yeah. Yes. And is it included in the second year? I believe so. So this is for 22, 23. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also included in the fiscal plan, the two-year fiscal plan for 23-24. It will be renewed. So the ongoing funding for this program is, is annually $150,000. So we will have another cycle of these grants. Okay, that's an important point. Mm -hmm. So am I clear that the current cycle is gonna award $150,000? No, so our current cycle is going to award three hundred thousand dollars. That's why our, our hope is that a majority of programs will end um, between within the twenty twenty three year. Like we'll end, majority will be happening by June twenty twenty three, um, and then we will launch a new cycle for the following fiscal year 
of grant program. So this is an annual grant program. May I just maybe, um, Katie, because obviously I have everyone on this call, you know city, city budgets. Um, uh, I think maybe, and I'm just speaking, if anyone has had that confusion, the reason why this year is 300,000 is because last year we did not utilize a grant cycle. We had, because as Bea said, um, we had our first grant cycle was um, 1920. And because of COVID, almost all of our grantees could not even do their programs. So we had programs that actually didn't even um, end. I think what Bea had last, the last one I think was April of 22. They just had to be postponed. And so we caught up, we were allowed to forward the 150 that just didn't get spent. But it'll only be, that's as Bea mentioned early on, it's a, that's a one-time bump. But then subsequent years written into the major city goal is the 150 a year. But that is not, and I think for clarity to someone else that asked, um, you cannot, it, um, multiple year funding, sequential funding is not guaranteed. So if you do an ongoing, so. Yeah, and sorry if I missed the beginning, I wasn't in the call yet. So um, yeah, sorry. But that's I, no, I don't think any of yeah, no apologies. Yeah, <laughs> so. that, that helps clarify my understanding of the 300 versus the ongoing right. 150. Yeah, good question. It's, it's, yeah, it's a nice anomaly this year. Yeah, got it. Thank you so much, Rita. Oh, that was from before. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, any other questions? These are great great questions and meant to kind of work through any of the things that you all are navigating as you're thinking about your projects and filling out these applications. Okay, well, I will just stay on for um, a minute, a few minutes, but again, thank you all for coming. Really looking forward to receiving these applications and, and being able to um, put some dollars into our community to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thanks Thank so you, Bea. Thank you, Dale. Bye. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs>